Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. Thanks for joining me today. My name is Judy Cho and I'm board certified in holistic nutrition. And I have a private practice where we focus on root cause healing. And it often starts with the carnivore cures, all meat elimination diet. Today, I had the pleasure of sitting down again with Dr. Sean O'Mara. We had a interview that he talks a lot about the differences of visceral fat as well as subcutaneous fat in lots of images. So make sure to check out our first interview. It will be in the show notes. Dr. O'Mara and I talk about some updates that he has found in terms of gauging visceral fat. And we talk about the nuances of MRIs as well as what really is sprinting and some of his beliefs on diet as well as fasting. Dr. Sean O'Mara is a medical doctor and a health and performance optimizing physician. And he is also a researcher. Dr. O'Mara is the founder of an innovative medical startup in Minneapolis called Lantu, and he focuses on health and performance optimization. The National Science Foundation in 2016 awarded Dr. O'Mara's group with a research grant to reverse chronic disease, which is the leading cause of death in both the U.S. and worldwide. Dr. O'Mara is a international lecturer and researcher and advocate for wellness. In our talk today, we talk a little bit more about visceral fat and then even nuances about subcutaneous fat. We talk a lot about back fat and love handles and what that actually means for your health. It's a very fascinating conversation. Dr. O'Mara is just a fun person to chat with. He's always open to new information and just, you can tell the love that he has for the community and the people to just get them to better health. When Dr. O'Mara and I stopped recording, we talked a little bit about ferments because he talks about it a lot. And we talked about the little nuances of where fermented veggies can be beneficial. So I let him know my stance on it. And I think that ferments and fermented vegetables and even the brine can be beneficial when you are healing. I think it's nuanced where if you are suffering from fungal overgrowth or CFO or possibly even SIBO, that maybe ferments or fermented veggies as well as the brine may not do you any benefits because those fungal overgrowth can actually live off of the fermented veggies. So when I think you have healed and you are healing and you could tolerate them and you actually feel better taking them, then I don't think it's an issue if you want to include it in the diet. This is where nuance matters. And then he asked me, well, without testing, how do you determine if someone may be suffering from fungal overgrowth? And this is a conversation I need to be sharing with the community and I should do a video, but the easiest way to know if that you're possibly suffering from CFO or fungal overgrowth is if you always have athlete's foot or jock itch, or you suffer with UTIs, or you have a lot of vaginal itch, or if you have scalp itch and you suffer with a lot of dandruff, these are, and they're perpetuating. And even if you take antibiotics, they don't fully go away. And the thing about antibiotics is when you take antibiotics, it will kill the bad, but it also kills the good. And then what happens is the fungus is able to thrive even more because there's no competition in the same space. So CFO is primarily in your intestines and it's fungal overgrowth and it has nothing to do with bacterial. And so if you ever have done a SIBO test and it came out negative, but you have all the symptoms of SIBO, you may be suffering from CFO. So it's small intestinal fungal overgrowth. And we talked a little bit about that. So my overarching opinion to him was that I think fermented veggies can be beneficial and have a place as long as you're not suffering from things like CFO or fungal overgrowth. And another example of CFO I forgot is that you are have persistent candida or you have constant rashes that even reducing all sugars do not heal them. As part of Dr. O'Mara's protocol, he does like including fermented veggies. So I think for the average person, it's probably decent to include, but just figure out what makes sense for you. And that was a nuance that we did not capture until after we stopped recording. Okay, guys, let's get right into the interview. Hi, Dr. O'Mara. I am so excited to sit with you and chat with you. Your video, your lecture on or at the Carnivore Summit was very, very well taken and loved. And I know you got some of that feedback, but for the people that may not have watched our first interview, I will put it in the show notes, but if you can introduce yourself. Sure. So I am Sean O'Mara. I'm a uh, MD physician researcher trained in emergency medicine, former unhealthy, overweight very disease riddled uh, physician uh, turned healthy through eating um, a healthier way of, uh, of living and a, a healthier lifestyle and compelled to go into research because it had such a profound effect on my own life and my own level of health. So 
here I am now busy in the space of social media, sharing clinical science because it's the kind of science just like you share. It's not really popular in conventional channels because uh, it it doesn't allow for maximizing profit in treating disease. And so it's through these kind of uh, opportunities and podcasts and, and uh, social media that uh, us all, uh, clinicians in this particular space that are advocating a healthier life get to share this content with followers. So great to be back. Loved being on the Carnivore Summit. What a great job uh, you did with that and your the whole community showing up and participating in that. I look forward to uh, many more of those and, and participating in those as well. And I love that you share all these images because it's very hard for us as commoners to access all of these different MRIs and learn from it, but you take the time and teach us how to even look at visceral fat versus subcutaneous. I wanted to ask a lot of the questions that our audience has asked um, that, you know, the nuances about what you mean about sprinting, how often and such. So we'll get into all of that. But just for, let's set the lay of the land, what is subcutaneous fat versus visceral fat and why sh we should worry about one versus the other? Yeah, so for a long time, we've known about subcutaneous fat because uh, we've been able to um, track it ourselves. It's the kind of fat that the pinch, the inch of fat that's typically on your abdomen. Most commonly, uh, if you wanna grab fat, you grab your abdomen, but that subcutaneous fat is really all over the body and you can pinch it. It's on the exterior subcutaneous, meaning just below cutaneous, the skin. So it's the layer of fat that's just underneath the skin. And in many studies, if you Google subcutaneous fat comma benefits, you can find scientific studies showing a correlation to um, a level of improved health from subcutaneous fat. So I like to point out not all fat is bad, and we need to uh, raise awareness about tissue being different in the body, and that is certainly the case when it comes to subcutaneous fat. Now, the opposite of subcutaneous fat, which is um, a type of fat that is very detrimental, is visceral fat, and visceral uh, is the term for organ fat. It's the fat around the organs, and associated with uh, proximity to organs. And so visceral fat typically is found deep in the corpus inside the body. So it resides on an MRI scan, which is very useful. This is a single slice through the abdomen, what we call an axial slice of through an axis. And there are different ways of viewing the body. Sometimes you go perpendicular up and down, superior and inferior. In this case, we're going anterior, which is kind of like where the belly button would be, and a posterior direction where the back muscles are, where you might be laying down in a bed that goes into an MRI scanner. So that's exactly the orientation that these, this image was obtained. And visceral fat is that white that is in the center of that scan. So on an MRI scan, fat is white. And on a CT scan, it's inverse, fat is black. So you can read visceral fat on an abdominal CT, if you ever had one, by looking at your images and taking a look at the center blackness. Here, we're looking at the center whiteness. And so the dark things are muscles. So what shows up, I mean, muscle shows up on an MRI scan is dark, and so too do the organs. So the viscera, your um, intestines, your colon, uh, descending colon, ascending colon, transverse colon, these are all uh, showing up as dark structures in the abdomen. But what you really need to pay attention to is the dangerous kind of fat, visceral fat, which is in the middle. And so all of the outside fat, this white outside of the muscles, are what ref is referred to as subcutaneous fat. So if you do hopefully listen to us today and you decide that you're going to Google subcutaneous fat comma benefits, then you can see studies that come up and maybe throw in scientific study or science, help direct you towards those resources in Google or go to chat GPT or AI and have this information pulled up. You will see that there are numerous studies showing the benefits of subcutaneous fat, but I want to share another biomarker that, uh, if you don't mind, uh, or we can hold off um, with the audience that pertains to subcutaneous fat that will help to show that it's even far more protective and beneficial than we understand because we're lumping in some 
a specific type of subcutaneous fat that's harmful. And so we're basically combining these two things, really good stuff with really bad stuff and kind of getting, you know, pretty good findings that show it's beneficial. But if you eliminate the bad stuff, then you see you, I'm just going to come out and say, I know some of the people in the carnivore community are bodybuilders who may not like this, but I'm just going to come out and tell you, if you're a bodybuilder and you can see your six pack, you are not enjoying optimized health. You really want to have some protective layer of subcutaneous fat. It really does provide an extra level of protection against metabolic syndrome and cardiovascular disease in particular, and also hepas or liver fat, hepatic fat. I forgot what the term of it was, <laughs> hepatic fat, so, or hep, uh, hepastiatosis. So um, that subcutaneous fat, um, particularly in, in this one form is very beneficial, but in another form of subcutaneous fat, I'll just come out and say what it is, it's called deep subcutaneous fat. Now, for the first time on media, I'm gonna share it with, with uh, uh, followers of uh, Nutrition with Judy. I love this show and I'm coming, this is where I'm coming to share this and break it first is this new biomarker that's called deep subcutaneous fat, okay? You'll see it and it's in all my images if you go on the internet. So this one is so important that nature even separates deep from superficial subcutaneous fat. And the way it separates it through a fascial plane called scarpa fascia. So you see this black line here, ladies and gentlemen watching today, this black line that goes around there is separating superficial subcutaneous fat from deep subcutaneous fat. So the superficial kind is really beneficial, protecting against metabolic syndrome and reducing cardio, your threat from cardiovascular disease. And this subcutaneous fat is the complete opposite. It's harmful, it increases metabolic syndrome, and it increases your risk for cardiovascular disease. How is this possible? This stuff here, the deep kind, secretes out inflammatory cytokines and adipokines similar to the way visceral adipose tissue is producing these things. So it's detrimental, it's harmful, and superficial subcutaneous fat, this part here that's very superficial, separated by this fascial plane that you can see, that stuff is good. And it secretes a very beneficial molecule called adiponectin, adiponectin. And you can Google adiponectin, which is spelled just like it sounds, A-D-I-P-O-N-E-C-T-I-N. You can go to Google and read about its beneficial it's produced by this stuff, but not really here. And this stuff produces all the inflammatory substances, IL-6, tumor necrosis factor A, other cytokines that are inflammatory in nature, like resistant, which causes resistance to insulin and it contributes to insulin resistance and is um, also lipid resistance as, as, as leptin resistance as well. So this is really a, a bad player, and I'm, I'm happy to share that with your audience. And here's the interesting thing I'll share with you, Judy, is where this is located. See all that white? This is down in the lower part of your back. Okay, so check this out. If you're listening today and you hate love handles, you might th tolerate your thunder thighs. You might tolerate a big butt. But when it comes to love handles, you do not like those. That's biology. You know why? That's nature telling you that that is not good and you wanna get rid of those love handles. So associated with love handles is a deep, deep subcutaneous fat, more of that. And in the absence of love handles, you don't have as much. So here's somebody who's got even higher visceral fat and more of those love handles here. And you can see their deep subcutaneous fat is profound, very, very big there. So. Deep subcutaneous fat correlates with visceral fat. So what does that mean? I'm presenting to you for the first time on the internet that I think it is a proxy for visceral fat. So when you can reach back and feel your love handles, that's a big warning that you probably have. I'm going to say, Dr. Sean's coming out of line and say, you got visceral fat that you need to correct. So it's a really cool marker, a brand new biomarker that, that I want to be able to share and share it on your channel so that your, your followers here at first before anywhere else. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I think it's so interesting. So 
from my understanding of what you're saying, that separation of the black line, so the closer fat to your maybe back, so that superficial subcutaneous fat is protective, it pr releases the adipotectin, and it has all the good stuff. But the deeper subcutaneous fat that's closer to your organs and that separation of that black line, but that is not as uh, beneficial because it releases all of those cytokines, inflammation, and it could be indicative of how much possible visceral fat you have. Ladies and gentlemen, Nutrition with Judy <laughs> is smarter than Dr. Sean. She did not know anything about this. She just got that in a few seconds and pulled it back. No, I'm a good I student. I think about this for hours. Judy is smarter than Sean. <laughs> no. I'm very impressed. You could pull that together so quickly because uh, you're exactly right. And this is a fairly complex uh, subject uh, to, to discuss. I've ran it by a few other people, um, not through social media, just run it by them. And nobody has gotten as fast as you guys. So you can have me back on your show anytime, <laughs> Judy. I, I have a quick I'm question really though. Thank you. you it like that. Thank you, thank you. So a really quick question. I had friends when we were in high school, very, very lean, but you know, we would wear like tighter clothes and they would have back fat, but they don't look like the people that would be carrying visceral fat. So I would always hear from certain people or maybe the wellness space that certain people just carry more back fat or the love handles. So is that not a case? And would you actually consider it a risk for possible visceral fat? Absolutely. In fact, right. I've yet to see in the close to several hundred MRIs that I've taken a look at recently since I found this biomarker, a single exception where deep subcutaneous fat was present without a corresponding amount of visceral fat. So what does that mean? It's not like it's a light switch. The more profound your deep subcutaneous fat, your, your love handles, the more visceral fat you're gonna have. And the corollary is also the, the case, the more visceral fat you have, the more love handles you're gonna have. I have yet to find a single exception to that rule. That when, if somebody has visceral fat, they always have love handles. And somebody has love handles, they always have visceral fat. So you can take it to the bank from, from Sean. I'm going to come out and say that they are that closely related and uh, they're, they're a proxy for each other. And I think uh, I reserve the right to change my mind if there's some sort of unique individual out there. But based on the overwhelming prevalence of uh, love handles correlating to visceral fat by degree, I'm going to say that's exactly the case. So those younger friends of yours in former days that had love handles and may have looked like they were thinner. They were basically topies, thin on the outside, but fat on the inside, with the exception of their love handles. So topies, we already know, people that have a lower amount of subcutaneous fat, but a higher amount of visceral fat have increased risk for mortality. And I'm going to say it's, again, explained by the fact that when you don't have as much adiponectin and the beneficial protection of superficial subcutaneous fat, and you have higher amounts of visceral fat, then it leads to increased mortality and really increased inflammatory mediated pathology, disease, diseases, chronic diseases in your body from inflammation that are directly associated with or uh, coming from uh, that huge, very detrimental depot of fat called visceral fat deep in your belly. So you said there's a proxy. It looks like the deeper subcutaneous fat is a proxy for possible visceral. I, I'm sure it's kind of new, but do you think it's a relationship of like a one-to-one -one, or is it just hard to say right now? Yeah, it's hard to say by right now, but it's uh, in proportion to. So if you reach back there and you have uh, more love handles mm -hmm. uh, than, than you want, you can believe that you have visceral fat. Now, the correlation uh, to disease is stronger in males than it does in, in females. But the correlation to visceral fat is maintained between both men and women. So um, if you have love handles as a woman, that means you got visceral fat but the degree correlation to disease is stronger male. So if you're a guy and you've got love handles, you've got a greater, even greater chance of mortality and disease than females. And I'll, I will submit to you that that kind of comports with our own experience with looking at people. So let's just pretend Sean and Judy and your audience are at the beach right now. And we're looking at men and women, guys in, uh, 
short bathing suits, women bikinis, and we're looking at their love handles. Which one is more viscerally offensive to you? The woman that has, you know, fullness and, and love handles back there, or the man that's got uh, fullness and love handles back there? I would submit to you it's the male that would be more problematic looking and uh, less becoming as a human being. And that's it's not a judgmental point. Sure. I'm a physician. I'm speaking to health. I'm not talking about the person's heart or their soul or whether they're, they're you know, a good person or not. I'm just speaking to their biology. And that their biology needs could be improved and uh, needs they need to get rid of their visceral fat that they have and uh, get rid of those love handles. And I suspect our ancestors of old would have picked up on that nuance very early and said, it would have been you. You would have been saying, Sean, you're, you're getting some fullness back there in your love handles. And I think today you're not going out on the hunt. I think you need to stay back and work on some sprints uh, and be ready to you know do some other things. But we're not having you on the hunt to get rid of those those uh, those love handles a little bit. Something like that had been a kind of a discussion. So um, I think we've lost track of our abilities to read our bodies, to know who's healthy or not. And if you pay attention to what's going on in the media, they would have us all believing that obesity is something that we should just accept and you're healthy at any weight. And, uh, you know, just the, what I call the homogeneity of human beings, except everybody you know, the diseased and the not diseased. I'm not rejecting anybody. I'm rejecting their disease, you know. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't su subscribe to belief that you can be healthy at uh, any weight. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that. We work with so many people and we run labs and people that tend to be overweight at a certain point, their markers don't look good. So I just, I have a hard time believing that everyone that's sharing the healthy at any size is truly healthy in terms of lab markers and other metabolic um, signs. I'm sure someone's going to ask the question, how much love handles is okay enough to have, right? Because you would assume that only maybe the leanest would have no love handles if they're wearing tight pants. It's a good question. It's a fair question to ask. And I guess, well, what level of disease are you comfortable putting up with? Okay. This is the other way, I guess, to answer that and is because if you have any love handles at all that you either can see or feel, then you can be assured that you have uh, some visceral fat inside of you, which is causing inflammation. Now, you know, to some people, they may be tolerant of, uh, you know, having more degree, degrees of uh, disease inside their body than others. But uh, I would submit to you that um, disease is not something that is meant to be tolerated and enjoyed in our life. It doesn't uh, provide any particular useful uh, contribution to our quality of living. It takes from a quality of living. So I uh, rather regard and feel that uh, homo sapiens, members of the human species race, have a duty and obligation to live their lives as healthy as they can be and to be free of disease. And that, that we should be also um, basically promoting the same kind of abilities in other people. So I don't think we should be trying to tolerate it. I don't think we should look for um, a magic number or a particular quantity of either visceral fat or love handles beyond which we should, uh, you know, resist or uh, underneath we're, we're, we're okay. I think you should uh, generally try to be as healthy as possible. And my definition, I don't mind repeating, my definition of health is pretty simple. It's just how you look and how you perform. So I would include in the appearance of how you look, um, your how your love handles look, of the sagittal abdominal diameter uh, that you have in your body, how far your, your belly sticks out, and the appearance of your face, whether it's uh, low in inflammation. And we're, I, I've seen now in research studies that show, and I've, I've pulled my own MRIs to my clients, the amiss fascinating, the amount of visceral fat that you have in your abdomen corresponds to the amount of temporal mandibular fat that you have up in your temple regions and your buccal regions in your face. So these phases of people that are big and inflamed, it is in fact fat being deposited within our face and around our skulls um, that are actually signaling, I am not living well, I am accumulating visceral fat. And as you eliminate visceral fat, you get a, very, a much leaner face. And you know, my own, my own face is, 
has become extraordinarily, you know, lean. It's not like I'm thin. I'm actually put on weight relative to my periods when I had a lot of visceral fat, but I've got, I've re uh, eliminated that fat that was around my face and my head and in my abdomen. And now um, I enjoy maybe some sub superficial subcutaneous fat. And then I've, I've put on a great deal of muscle. So um, I like to say to people, when you get rid of visceral fat, you get in shape. So your body takes on a different shape and so does your face. So it's the kind of a, uh, the shape of a face when uh, you were in your teenage years, say 15 to about 18, 19, maybe 22, you had this leaner look to your face and, and uh, it showed a, a lack of visceral fat. But as you continue to age, you accumulate visceral fat and then it causes inflammatory effects and deposition of fat elsewhere in your face and around your head that starts signaling, um, I am accumulating visceral fat to the informed consumer who may be listening to Nutrition with Judy right now, or if you follow me on my, uh, in my, my Instagram page, you're, you're aware of these, uh, these discussions about visceral fat. So it's, it's really fascinating. So it's all systemic. You know, it, I'd like to point out to my client patients that you know, the, there is no isolated tissue with regard to health. Our, our tissue tells the story consistently in our hand, our toenails, our sexual genitalia, our hair, the appearance of our face, the shape of our abdomen, the postural tonicity of our muscles, the visible nature of pulses in the, um, in the, in the arteries, and uh, the external vasculature of the veins. Everything can, tells this consistent story of the degree of health that we enjoy. Yeah, no, that, that makes so much sense. It, it's funny because as women age or, and, and I would specifically say women, but when women tend to lose weight, their face will get smaller, which is what you're saying. And when they lose the weight though, they look older because their face isn't as plump. <laughs> so there's this like battle for a lot of older women that'll say either I have, I want to be thin but then I'll look older or I'll keep the weight on and my face will look younger. So it's this, but yeah. it's exactly with what you're saying. So it just, it's interesting. Yeah, I, I tell, and I, I hear that a lot actually, Judy. So I tell people hang in there because when you get rid of visceral fat, your body starts responding better to the hormetic uh, experiences and stimulus that, that we encounter in life, such as lifting weights, right. using a sauna, cold shower, uh, fasting, different things that you're exposed to that are hormetic in nature, you know, that which does not kill you makes you stronger. So not too much of it. Like if you uh, do distance running, I think that's problematic. But if you do sprinting, it's a very intense but brief stimulus. Lifting weights for a brief, short, intense period of time causes a beneficial response. But visceral fat actually impairs your body's ability to respond to the stimulus. So if you're a woman today who has lost visceral fat, you've lost weight, and your face is not as full as it was before, and you feel like your face is a little sagging, I know what you mean. All my client patients go through that. But guess what? Here's the good news. It slowly improves to a beautiful state, more heading in the direction where you formerly were when you were a teenager. But you have to keep you know, heading in that direction. you got to keep living well. So... There is a period of adjustment uh, that, that people go through, uh, but it's worth not giving up on. And uh, your face definitely will improve because, listen, we're meant to improve. As we age, we're not meant to get more disease, become more inflamed looking. We acquire more knowledge. And so we should also be reflecting that acquisition of desirable knowledge in the terms of how we appear and how we perform and really how we're living our lives. Right. And as you eat a more meat focused diet, you'll have all the proper nutrients, um, the ability to turn over collagen. And then if you're hydrating yourself, all of those things, I mean, there's no net negative in all of that. And then if you're reducing your visceral fat, all of that would be highly beneficial. Absolutely. You know, I feel so uh, sad for our, our vegan and vegetarian counterparts who are missing out on the, the, the contribution of meat because um, I look at their photographs on the internet uh, as they continue to age, and I look at these external biomarkers, and I wish that their physicians paid as much attention to these natural biomarkers as I do, um, or and, or as they are spending following a man-made biomarker identified, you know, as just uh, cholesterol, 
uh, that they're trying to decide and everybody has a different interpretation of whether it's, you know, it's high, it's low, it's good or bad. I mean, we're just, I, I stay out of that particular fray because it's a, to me as a red herring and, and a discouragement. I'll come out to say, opine on your show, since you're a fellow carnivore, that I think we'd make a tactical error for the sake of the health of our followers when we engage in that discussion, because I think it truly is nothing more than a distraction. And so what we ought to be paying attention to are more effective biomarkers of health, such as visceral fat, which no vegan physician will come out and jump on board. I've yet to see a vegan physician respond to my invitation uh, to get an MRI scan of their abdomen and share their visceral fat uh, response. It just doesn't, it doesn't happen. So these that within the vegan community, their faces become increasingly more inflamed and then and their and their muscles become more riddled with fatty infiltration of their muscles and in, in, in a condition called myosteatosis, which just about a, a month ago was found in artificial intelligence AI uh, to double your risk of cardiovascular disease. So this fatty inflammatory fat being deposited in your muscles corresponds again directly to the amount of visceral fat that you have. So it's it's another proxy to visceral fat, but you have to have an MRI to see it or you have to have a muscle biopsy. But uh, it's why, and every time I bring this up, um, the, the vegans have a response this way and I'll nip it in the bud. Uh, it's why you don't see vegans that are old, uh, practicing mm -hmm. veganism and meat deprivation or elimination that have good muscle tone after they've done it for a long time. And now don't go and show me young, beautiful ones those are young. They haven't been deprived of meat long enough yet to have suffered myosteatosis. I'll watch that young man or woman who I will say probably looks pretty good uh, for the next 10 to 15 to 20 years. Then we'll have you revisit and how they look. But ladies and gentlemen, don't wait. If you know somebody who's vegan, don't wait for them to, um, to lose the benefits of meat. You know, challenge them now to go get an MRI scan of their, their visceral fat and watch what's happening on a yearly basis. It would be money well spent to see that they are, in fact, increasing their visceral fat vis and fat around their, their organs, such as their heart and their deep. Now you learned about deep subcutaneous fat here and then fat de deposition within their muscles. You know, don't be blindly following uh, the, the advice of, of people. Uh, they're trying to tell you uh, to, to follow this particular biomarker. You want to you want to be looking better and performing better. And if you're not looking better and you're not performing better, it's time for you to do a reevaluation. If you don't have access to the MRI, I mean, I, that's ideal. But could we possibly just go by our level of back fat or the love handles? I think so. I think if you honestly cannot afford, but I like to challenge people, you know, <laughs> Uh, in Los Angeles, you can get a full abdominal MRI for 350 bucks. I mean, th that's extraordinary. Now, in Minnesota, um, there are parts of Minnesota, they're $2,900. And that's when you are paying cash. If you come with insurance, you're going to be paying even more. So uh, it's all market driven. Okay. But I'd like to share with the audience, you know, uh, in the future, what I'd like to work on is to see if we can uh, change how abdominal MRIs are done, moving away from a, a disease treating model, which is predicated upon trying to find the most amount of disease, to a wellness model or a health optimizing model where you take a single slice of the abdomen, ideally maybe at L3, lumbar 3, so it's a consistent marker that can be duplicated and, and standardized, and you look at the degree of adiposity in the viscera and in the subcutaneous uh, compartments of subcutaneous fat include superficial subcutaneous and deep subcutaneous fat. And if we only did one slice, then operationally from a business standpoint, right. we may be able to substantially reduce the cost of those MRIs from, you know, wh where they are right now, which is anywhere from in Minnesota, we get them from 500 to $3,000 we could probably get those down uh, to uh, an order below $100, I think, if we did a single slice abdomen. But to your question, yeah, if you absolutely cannot cough up, and I would say $700 to, to really find this incredibly beneficial biomarker, then for darn sure, I'd be working diligently for the next uh, year to eliminate 
your uh, love handles as, as much as possible, and also correcting your sagittal abdominal diameter. And that means you basically want to get a flat abdomen like you had when you were 16 to 18 years of age. And uh, that, that really happens because your abdominal musculature is holding in your guts. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't teach us this in medical school, but I remember I'm an ER physician. Majority of people that we do abdominal exams on, palpating their abdomen, pressing down to feed all the organs to see what is disease, who might have surgery. We could feel the abdominal musculature were so relaxed in people because they, and now I know it's because they had mild steatosis, their, their, their muscles were no longer performing to hold their guts in. You could push straight, straight down and when they stand up, they get a dad bod or a soccer mom bot, body and soccer moms, nothing gets you against you, but a lot of you complain that your belly sticks out because of uh, childbirth. Well, I think it's probably more bagels and muffins. Uh, visceral fat and fatty infiltrates in the musculature because if you cut that out from your diet and you live healthy that abdomen can return to a more and and in the first place if you don't have visceral fat you're not going to get that that stretch from the the partum's uh, effects of, of, of pregnancy so young people when they stand up are nice and straight flat abdomens because their muscles hold it in when we do abdominal exams in the er on teenagers who are coming in for we call rule out appy. Somebody might have an appendicitis. Their muscles are so tight. I used to say, come on, relax your muscles. Come on, let me, I, I need to feel your appendix. And they go, I am, I am. You know, it's literally their muscles were working that strong that, that interfered with our ability to push down to try to feel their guts. And you've lost that. If you're listening today and you get down, you know, you stand up and your belly's sticking out, you got a dad bod or a soccer mom body that's sticking out. Is because of the fatty infiltrates of your of your muscles in your abdomen and your muscles are now starting to relax. And with that, so to you get lunch lady arms, you get man boobs. If you have pe pectoralis majors uh, infiltrated with mild steatosis, and you're a guy in your 40s, 50s, and 60s, your pectoralis major starts sagging. Uh, it's a decline in health from this fatty infiltration. Uh, that's occurring uniformly throughout the body. So I like to have the dialogue and lead the discussion that we need to, to pay attention to how the bodies are appearing and how the bodies perform. Because when you got a dad bod, it's not attraction, it's declining performance. Now I know all the, the, the gym rats are going to say, wow, I can still bench this and that. Well, okay, let's see you climb a rope. Let's see you climb a tree. Let's see you climb out of a window in a house fire. That's, that's the kind of performance you want to have uniformly good across um, a multiple spectrum of things, not just one trick pony that's really strong that can bench a lot of weight, uh, but your muscles are filling up uh, with uh, fatty interest because you keep carbon out and you think you, you know, you got it going because you learned that when you're 16 years old. So it really diet does play a matter. And, and uh, I really think it's an imperative to have these kind of discussions. So Let's talk about some of the steps of reducing visceral fat. So obviously we want to reduce the love handles or the back fat. Um, we, when we stand, we don't want to have this gut coming out of the mom or dad bod. Um, you know, in our last episode, we talked about sprinting and we talked about eating a cleaner diet without processed foods. Let's talk a little bit about the sprinting. Cause I think that was the most questions I got from the community. So what do you mean by sprinting? Obviously it's running fast, but you know, for how long, how often, how yeah. many intervals, <laughs> like these are the yeah. nuanced questions. Uh, and I get the wondering. same questions too <laughs> every day in my uh, social media account. So sprinting, the definition really is is, is uh, uh, the easiest to hit, hit up front. So it's maximum effort running. So you have to run the very fastest you can. So what might be a sprint for a 65-year-old uh, or an 85-year-old is very different looking than a sprint for a 15-year-old. You know, it doesn't relate to a certain speed. It really relates to maximum effort. And with that maximum effort at about the uh, fifth, uh, I would say about the 10 to 15 second point, you're expended your glycogen and now you're, you're moving into anaerobic metabolism. So sprinting, uh, it really requires you to run as fast as you possibly can. And then as far as the length of time goes, you know, that I would recommend because I use it as one of my exercise, probably my most important exercise strategy is in fact, uh, sprinting. Um, my recommendation is first and foremostly mix it up. 
So what do I mean by that? I would sprint anywhere from uh, uh, as little as two seconds to maybe as long as 60 seconds, the latter being very rare. I think typically the majority of our sprints would have been around um, maybe the uh, uh, 10 to 20 second uh, time period. So that's your sweet spot. I think you want to hang out uh, closer to 10 to 12 seconds. And then uh, every once in a while, maybe do a 30 second sprint. Why do I say every once in a while? Because listen, when we sprinted, it was because basically two things. Um, we were trying to get away from a threat or we were trying to be a threat to something else. And those conditions that our ancestors uh, formerly encountered um, then always varied. They were not uniformly always 12.3 seconds. They would have been, sometimes we had to sprint for a long time uh, and sometimes we sprinted less. And what we do see in nature, that nature with regard to biological op optimization of our body and our health prefers variability. We see it in heart rate variability. We see it with weightlifting. You don't want muscle memory. You want to change things. We see it with fasting. We see it with um, all manner of different physiological processes uh, that change, that dynamic change brings benefit. So you don't want to always sprint the same distance. Um, you always want to uh, sprint the same way in terms of max effort. When we were chasing something to try to eat it to uh, be able to live, we gave it our all. We weren't, you know, <laughs> we weren't kind of half effort about it. And same thing when, when a bear or somebody was trying to kill us, uh, we weren't nonchalant about that threat either. We ran the fastest we could. So um, maximum effort and then mix it up in terms of uh, how long and how many, you know, mix up how many sprints you might do. Typically, uh, on average, I have my clients sprinting six sprints for around 10 seconds every other day as kind of a, a general, uh, you know, strategy. What if you don't have good knee function? Yeah. So that's another one that I get a lot. So there's some alternative events. Uh, first, I like to say that I hear that a lot. And a lot of people have bad knees because of distance running. And so distance running causes repetitive forces over a period of time, which has more of a destructive effect than the more substantial forces that you get for a shorter period of time. So what does that mean? Um, very often, it's the case of people that have destroyed their knees from running can find out that they can slowly reintroduce sprinting for shorter distances in a much shorter period of time um, and tolerate it quite well. So I would say, first of all, make sure that you're not dismissing sprint, sprinting prematurely because of distance running. So the first thing to do is be working on eliminating the, the furnace of inflammation that's causing destructive fire and degenerate joint disease in your, in your knees by cutting out processed foods and carbohydrates and adopting a super healthy meat optimizing diet so that uh, you can eliminate that visceral fat and the problems in the first place. But then um, if you really have problems with your knees, and some people legitimately can't run. There was a, a, one of, a follower of mine that had a retinal tear. <laughs> so sometimes you just can't, you can't exert in that. And you may have to do another alternative form of exercise that is maximum effort, maximum intensity without impact within the, the eye. So you, you're going to have to specifically address with your provider, uh, if that's the case, what you're capable of doing so that he or she can guide you on that. But some general alternates to sprinting that's like perhaps you're a, a bilateral amputee of your lower extremities, you could consider maybe rowing using upper extremity arms. Or if you have your legs, but you, you cannot uh, run, you may be able to cycle where you do sprinting on cycles. There are a lot of studies on sprinting, the benefits of sprinting, then in fact, never use any sprinting at all. They just use uh, ergonomic bicycles that were stationary and uh, they emulated the conditions. But I like to say they never perfectly reproduced the conditions of sprinting. So first and foremost, if there is no true substitute for sprinting. Try to do it if you can. And then consider uh, cycling, consider rowing. And then an other alternative is sprint swimming, where you simply 
swim as fast as you can, or you try sprinting with your legs in a pool against resistance to water, which is another way. And then a really interesting way, if you can still walk and maybe manage to, uh, to sprint, is to, if you're particularly older, this is beneficial, sprint uphill. So the forces required to sprint uphill, driving down to the ground. And those are the forces that are, by the way, propel you and make you run faster as the forces you know, strike in the ground, your foot strike in the ground. You can diminish those forces and the subsequent consequential impact on the joint by sprinting uphill. So what's interesting about that is it's biome biomechanically less challenging because the complexity of moving your legs are reduced, your joints, because the speed is not as fast. And so when you sprint uphill, your legs and joints are moving slower and the calculations are not so bad. But where you really get in trouble is if you are not so good with those calculations and you sprint going downhill. Now those legs are moving faster than the calculations have ever been done before. And that's where you really can get in trouble and get a bad damage, uh, some significant damage. So sprinting uphill is, a, is another alternative event. Great question. If someone wasn't a runner ever and they started sprinting, is there a correlation with the ability to sprint and maybe for longer being a sign that you have possibly less visceral fat or that you're just healthier? Yeah, I have not seen it. I don't think I've ever encountered a uh, a study on that. What I can say is that that I have seen as a biomarker and anecdotally in my mm -hmm. own studies, because I and my clients who come to me and do my my alpha plane, which where I do a lot of medical photography and videography, um, I videotape them sprinting, and then I take freeze frames of them. The degree to which you can elevate your foot and elevate your knee in your leading leg, the leg that's out front when you take a freeze frame of it, corresponds to the amount of visceral fat you have. Interesting. That's very cool. So literally the angulations uh, and how well you perform are corresponding to that, to that visceral fat. So that is pretty interesting, but I, um, uh, to, to your earlier question, I've not seen it studied uh, any other way, but certainly the, the, least the, the less amount of visceral fat you have, the better, better you're going to perform and, and run faster. But it's particularly seen in how high you raise your foot, how high you raise your, your knee. Okay, so if, just to summarize this conversation about sprinting, ideally, if you can sprint, that would be ideal. If you have a bad knee, if it's from long distance running, that may not be the same impact as doing sprinting. If you can sprint every other day, that would be ideal and do the max capacity of whatever you can handle at that time. If I think in your practice, you said it's um, maybe 10, 15 seconds and at least four to six times. Was that correct? Yeah. So if you can um, do sprints about 10 to 10 to 15 seconds and you can do three to four sessions of okay. those uh, a week, I think uh, that would be that would be very beneficial. And, uh, you know, uh, maybe I'll just show you this. Okay. For sprinting, um, here's a, a client of mine who's older and had a lot of visceral fat. Um, they can barely lift their leg up. This is kind of the analysis we talk about. And then this is me, <laughs> and uh, I have very little visceral fat, but look how high I can get my, my knee up and how I can raise my foot and my knee together. So that's an example for your followers if they want to uh, take a look and see how how that uh, affects your your gait and when you're sprinting. So. Uh, yeah, so I definitely recommend about uh, 10 to 15 seconds uh, and about uh, three to four sessions of those. You can do it every day. Sometimes nature would have a sprinting every day because we had a lot of threat. Uh, eventually, we have too many, too much threat in area. It's too much stress, and it's time to get out of Dodge, and we just got to migrate to another location. We have that choice. You know, we would do it. But uh, sometimes you, you would uh, enjoy some relaxation. You may not. You might go a week without sprinting. So mix it up. Try not to apply a formula. And then another question I got was that a lot of your examples are males. Is there a difference for females? Yeah. So um, that does that question came up a, a lot. And one of the things I like to address is the fact that I don't have as many female clients uh, that are interested in, uh, you know, health optimization. And I think it's... Uh, 
uh, unfortunate, but I, I've gotten a few more since this subject has, has, come up, has come up. But one of the difference that we see in, um, in females on their MRIs is an abundance of subcutaneous fat. So women tend to have a higher degree of uh, ratio between subcutaneous fat and visceral fat. So that is a big difference in the MRI scan. So, and what's interesting too is the degree of superficial subcutaneous fat to deep subcutaneous fat. So you can see in females, they don't, they have almost the same amount of superficial to deep. Now look at um, males in this example here. Uh, males have much more deep subcutaneous fat than superficial. So there, there are distinct and profound differences in fat depots and, and especially inflammatory fat in females and males. And the answer to that is uh, probably the reproductive cycle. Women play a huge role in um, society and the species because of their child rearing responsibilities. And so they have less visceral fat and their subcutaneous fat pr provides them a layer of protection so that they're around nurturing, take care. And us guys uh, that have that deep subcutaneous fat and more, we tend to have more visceral fat. Now, th this guy has um, doesn't have much visceral fat in that particular example, but the individuals that have are males uh, are basically uh, genetic contributors and they're less important to, to, uh, uh, to the species beyond contributing to the, to the, to the gene pool. Sad. So women um, should get MRIs. Uh, they have completely different fat depots. Uh, they respond differently to different strategies. And, uh, but nonetheless, my recommendations are still across the board when you look at visceral fat to do the same things. Uh, adopting a, a meat-centric uh, carnivore diet first and foremostly, and then um, uh, fasting and uh, and doing sprinting, maximum intensity exercise, hormetic practices, saunas, cold showers, and uh, uh, and and optimizing exposure to sunshine. Uh, not getting too much, but an optimal amount. Optimizing your sleep, uh, de decreasing stress. And then when you say fasting, what do you typically recommend? Yeah, so this is interesting. I look at it purely from an ancestral standpoint. And uh, and then I also look at what studies have been showing to be the increased benefit from extended fasting through autophagy. So autophagy is this interesting practice of condition and state of physiology in our bodies where we clear up cellular debris. So the accumulation of byproducts of disease and just living starts to take its toll on cells and accumulates, but through the process of autophagy, which occurs uh, typically in increasing amounts, about 48 to 72 hours, we see elimination of that debris and improvement um, through uh, the influence of chaperone proteins, heat shock proteins, cold shock proteins to get created when we um, basically are exposed to hormetic activities which include fasting. So um, I start people very, very slow, Judy, on fasting because the last thing I want to do is have somebody have a bad experience with fasting and then walk away from their lifestyle, you know, optimization plan because they, they feel too weak and tired. But our ancestors would have slowly exposed us to uh, fasting just out of necessity. There wouldn't been anything to eat. Sometimes, you know, they couldn't have caught when they were out hunting. Uh, they weren't going to be successful every time bringing home um, meat. So you would have uh, had a fourth fast uh, out of necessity, and our bodies would have been uh, accustomed to routinely uh, to fasting. But today, I think we just simply eat too much and too frequently at the expense of our body's own ability to uh, promote and engage in autophagy, which is this fantastic benefit a beneficial process where you have this uh, cellular debris being cleared up. And there was a study in 2021 uh, where they looked at chaperone-mediated uh, autophagy activity, which is a marker of, of this mediated autophagy. They looked at this marker that was present within lysosomes, and they found in people that had strokes, the ones that the highest amount of that 
um, autophagy activity measured in that in that lysosome never went on to re have another stroke, which is unusual because kind of the defining feature of strokes is you're going to get more, you're going to get another one, it's going to be bad. In this case, they were able to suppress it. They found that people that had the highest amount of those never got strokes. And the ones with the um, the lowest um, lowest amounts always went on to stroke except for one person. And probably they will eventually stroke. It just was outside the window of the, that particular study period. So what that means is uh, you want to have autophagy. And there are other ways of getting autophagy other than fasting. But... The long and short of it is, I'm impressed with the with fasting. I think it was part of our ancestral existence, and I think it fits perfectly within a carnivore existence. I just think we we wouldn't have hunted every day. We, you know, we respected our food sources, and there wouldn't have been a need to eat. Um, you know, uh, uh, meat every single day. We would eat that meat, and we would eat a lot of it. So. I get my my client patients to eat a great deal of meat when they come off a fast and uh, to uh, stretch their stomachs in, in a manner in which our, probably our ancestors had the capacity uh, to eat an enormous amount of healthy meat like a uh, hot dog eating contest people could. And then uh, when they're fasting, um, uh, enjoy a period of time where they're not eating. And uh, that's where I tell my clients to get the most amount of exercise in, the most amount of saunas, the most amount of cold showers, exposure to sunshine and basically hormesis occurs in a fasted state. And then when you got a belly full of meat and all that blood is going to uh, the mesentery to, to help with the digestive process, and it's not going to your muscles or other locations to your body with the section of your brain and your, your essential organs, then you avoid exercising, avoid hermetic activities. So do you recommend eating one meal a day then from based on your fasting windows and whatnot? Yeah, uh, sometimes that's what I do. I get people, you know, through, um, you know, eventually I may not, they can't even, they, some of my clients started can't even tolerate uh, one meal a day. They have right. to kind of do intermittent fasting where they're doing six, six hour, you know, fasting period of time before they eat. And so they slowly work up to OMAD one meal a day. And then I pass, get them to go past 24 hours to okay. actually the next morning get up. And, and now they, they're, you know, they've got a 32 hour fast and they just slowly keep extending it sort of like um, the, the, the channel, more plates, more dates. So as you put more plates on a, on a barbell, you get more, uh, more body, body building or more attractive body. So the more fasting you do, um, the better you get at that and the more hormetic uh, experience. But you can't go from zero pounds to pressing 200 pounds. You got to right. ease into that. You got to slowly add those weights on the barbell. And so too with fasting, I think, you know, it's it's important that we just slowly increase that in a way that people um, acquire the capacity to fast, but not uh, do it in a in too premature or too quickly of a manner. Yeah, I think fasting is very individualized. I mean, just so I used to be the biggest fan of fasting and I fasted a lot and I sometimes do, I think I try to do at least once every two years, I'll try to do a five to seven day fast. And because I believe in the autophagy and just clearing up the cells, um, at least for that long period, but there are from working with so many different people, there are also people that maybe they have under ate their whole lives, or maybe they have disordered eating, or maybe they don't have the greatest bone mass and um, even musculature mass so that if they fast for too long, it just doesn't have as many benefits until they start their healing journey. And then maybe they can start incorporating fasting. Some people do have higher insulins where it will not come down as much as if they start really fasting. So I see- uh -huh. I see it yeah, all over I was gonna the say, That's a really good point. And um, I try to make that with regard to fasting because uh, there are certain populations of people um, that, that really can't uh, fast and they need to be very cautious. And uh, particularly people that have eating disorders, you know, it's it's easy to slip in from a eating disorder into fasting where you right. think your intentions are good and noble. And then you slip back into that, you know, that period of darkness and, and, uh, and disease state of um, 
um, that, that you were you were in when you, with your eating disorder. So I think those are good points. Let me ask you, what's your experience like after fasting, uh, going feeding for two years, and then you do a five to seven day fast? What in the world is that like? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so what I've learned in the last time I did five days and I'll, I did a short clip on it, so I'll put it in the notes, but, um, okay. it was so much harder than when I used to do like alternate day fastings of 36 hours and then leading into a five day. So the fact that I only have on most days, I eat two meals. I don't really snack in between. And then some days I do one meal a day. It's rare, but it's mo mostly two meals a day. And then I just go into that five day and it's always the second day that's harder. Um, I definitely don't have the difficulty the first day because I think I'm always in a state of ketosis, but then you just start missing eating. But by the third day I had low energy and I don't know if it's because I don't use that fasting muscle for that extensive of a period. And then doing it is just hard on my body. I definitely feel less energy than when I just eat the one to yeah. two meals a day. Yeah, well, I'm super impressed that you could you could last that long after feeding for two two years. And with regard to fasting, I think you you know I would say um, variability is the key here. You would, you don't want to get into a practice of fasting uh, where some people are 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 at with their gym routines to do exact same right, right. you know reps and sets and things. Remember, nature would mix things up, and and uh, we wouldn't always have the benefit of uh, having predictability or a set schedule. I think if anything, our lives were defined by not unpredictability and uh, anything but a set schedule. I think what's fascinating is your community seems to be more about health optimization and feeling and living and longevity. And I work with a lot of people that are really sick, so they don't even have the opportunity to even try to sprint. Um, I think some people can absolutely, but some people are just very, very sick. And so there are a subset of my community. So for example, there might be some people that had gastric bypass, so they can't even do the one meal a day. So I think that's where I think the messaging with fasting, I think it's so important if you can do it and if you could do it in the right way. But there are some people that, for example, have really bad gut health. So maybe they have H. pylori or they're struggling with SIBO or SIFO, which is the fungal overgrowth, or they have colitis or, you know, some type of disease. And that's where oh, yeah. the long-term fasting may not work or they'll fast because they feel better because it kind of keeps their disease dormant. But the minute they eat, they feel bad. So then they just go into another fast and they're basically, they're not in the moments they are refeeding. They're not eating enough to be healthy. So it's just a band aid. So then fasting for them becomes a band aid rather than optimal wellness. So I just wanted yeah. to put that clear. So no, that's a it. really good point. I, I have to count myself fortunate that the majority of people that seek me out are people that already enjoy uh, substantially pretty uh, okay. uh, exceptional level of health. And so it's it's really not much of a stretch for them to uh, to to adopt these kind of optimizing uh, strategies. But they're not for the average person. And so, um, and then they, they're followed pretty closely by me because I'm a, you know, attentive uh, treating clinician who really wants to stay on top of them, make sure they're, they're continuing to improve and, and uh, watch for complications. So yeah, my hat's off to you. I think you got a really challenging community and uh, such an important one because uh, the, the both ends of the spectrum that we're coming at trying to get rid of disease and get people healthy, right. healthy are important and inclusive. So yeah, um, that's, that's, those are really, really valid points, Judy. I think it's just good to share that nuance so that people know it's just not, I, I think for m maybe the most unwell, the, the goals that you mentioned are things that they could strive for and opportunities they can use. Right. So there are other ways to sprint other than the, um, the traditional sprinting. So like you said, you can maybe use some things with your arms. I just think that people should, like you said, when I asked how much specific back fat can you have? I think the goal should be, no, there should be zero back fat. And whether you achieve that is one thing, but at least try to attain that is a goal, right? So you want optimal health and I'm fully right there with you. I want people to have root cause healing. And then I want them to listen to more of your content and try to get zero back fat and stuff. So I, I think it's, it's a spectrum for people in the wellness space, but I do think people should not give up in trying to be their best, heal their best and do their best and not just band-aid things. And I think that's where we are very, very aligned. Yeah. Well, great. I, I love it. And, you know, one of the 
uh, benefits for getting in Lisa and, and my communities. I have an online chat room mm -hmm. that every day my clients are in chatting with each other and uh, it's awesome. And I, I participate in that and, and I, um, I've been surprised. It was, it came at the suggestion of a couple of my clients. And I think that the missing elements that as it provides us that we're meant to be uh, tribal and live in a clan. And, uh, you know, today, if you're healthy and you're trying to get yourself healthy, you, you oftentimes feel lonely because nobody else that you know in your family and media friends and circles oftentimes share your commitment and interest in getting healthy. And if anything, they, they opposed it or heading in a different direction. So, you know, if you can find a good, healthy community to hang out with that share your goals and ideals, um, it's, it's really quite an effective strategy or tool um, to help encourage you because I like to say you can't hunt by yourself. You know, the Absolutely. lone wolf doesn't hunt as well. So we're just, we're pack animals. We're meant to, to be tribal and clannish and uh, hang together in uh, all trying to get better. Absolutely. I think if someone is just starting their journey and they see you and you're already healed and optimized, it's so much harder to relate to you versus if there's somebody in your chat group that has started maybe a week ago, they can relate to that person much faster. And then they're motivated that I can get to Dr. O'Mara one day, but I may just have to have these like stepping stones to see other people that have already are, are healing and that th there's a way instead of you know, if you just see the end goal and it seems like a hundred pounds away or many, many sprints away, it seems daunting, but it's just yeah. that step-by-step. Step. And I think that's where the community is so important. So when you're in a place where you want to give up and someone else says, I was there, I understand. And I felt that, and this is what I did to get back up. That's the motivation people need. And that's the importance of the community and tribal. And I think it's so, so valid and it's so important. Yeah, it is just very inspiring. Uh, every time I get a new client that's, you know, in, in, a, in a pretty bad situation, if they're coming in, um, everybody comes to encourage them and help them out. And uh, yeah, it's, it's very inspiring. We, we, we're in a beautiful race and uh, our species humans. And uh, when we're, we're trying to help each other out, it's a beautiful thing. It's a noble thing. And uh, I just like your audience to always be thinking about how, you know, the direction that you're moving in. I tell my clients it's not a light switch that you flip and you're suddenly there. It's a journey that your purpose to to continue to improve and try to get better, moving in the right direction and uh, drawing from encouragement from others. If someone was going to get started today, would you recommend them starting to cut the processed carbs first or starting the sprinting? Uh, for sure, cutting processed carbs. I think they, they just have such a, an enormous negative contribution to their health um, that you, you got to stop the forest fire. You got to stop, yeah. you know, pouring gasoline um, on the fire disease that's inside your body. And uh, as good and as optimizing, as beneficial as uh, sprinting, lifting weights, exercise, these other things are. Um, I really feel that my lead strategy, my most important thing is getting control on that diet and uh, eliminating the, the most harmful con you know, contribution to, uh, to disease in our body is through our mouths um, and, and just the bad manner in which we're, we're led to believe that we're, we should, that it's okay to eat that way. Right. So uh, yeah, I, I lay in bed. I just am so troubled at the, the degree of, uh, of tolerance that we have for uh, processed foods and uh, the resistance to, to, uh, to stamp it out. Um, I, I just, there's something really rotten in uh, Denmark over this. I just, I think it needs to be investigated and, and uh, I, I'm trying to raise the hue and cry against uh, food processing. And uh, I think, I think there is, every year more awareness about it. But yeah, I think if you and I can do our parts to try to encourage other social influencers and our followers to do the same thing, you know, right. uh, followers are following other social influencers and should be challenging them, well, where are you and promoting awareness about processed foods and the dangers um, that they have. I, th I think it's a noble message that um, all of us in the social media space should be uniformly uh, warning our, our fellow uh, humans about.
Yeah, I think it's so important. I mean, one, I have young boys, so it's very near and dear to my heart. But I mean, I see all the junk food every time we have school gatherings and stuff. And but just not too long ago, type two diabetes was adult onset. And now just this week or last week, they approved a diabetic medication for children. And it's just where are we going with this? And it makes me so yeah. sad because I want my kids to have healthy peers and, um, and, and people that they can possibly marry in the future and, and have leadership with. And it just makes me sad that when we go to birthday parties and I limit the junk, it's just, I see moms roll their eyes at me as if I'm crazy and it's just let them live a little. And it's just, no, I know what this does to them. Right. And so yeah. it's, a, it's, isn't that something you know, it's just a lack of awareness on the part of those other parents when they react in that way about the harm. I mean, they're just led to believe it's a pretty red candy and it can't be that hard. Let them live a little bit. But, you know, if you really saw, and I think it's helpful to understand the impact on the microbiome right. that these um, processed foods are playing, then you see that little harm is actually compounded and further species and generation of cycles of uh, other microbes that are obesogenic and pathogenic in nature. So it's a simple whitewashing and underappreciation of the harm uh, that that one little uh, ice cream cone or uh, uh, candy bar uh, is having. It it's not just for that moment. It's it continues on right. and it's duplicated and magnified uh, exponentially within the microbiome in a ways that we just don't see and can't understand right now. And certainly that those other parents there have no exposure to it. And so, yeah, it's really sad that they conclude that way. And then they drop comments and things like that. But you be that mom, Judy. You, you know, you love your kid. I, I'm that dad. I'm that parent that loves my children. And, uh, and I stand against, you know, the forces of, uh, you know, um, processed foods and sugary candies and treats and things like that. And I've got all my kids through it. So um, I'm, I'm really happy today about the level of health that my children enjoy and that my wife and I are enjoying that we're trying to share as much as possible with clients and, and our followers and social media now. Well, thank you so much for everything you do. I mean, your pictures are really worth over a thousand words. And I think it's so important that you cannot forget how visceral fat looks. And now this difference between deep subcutaneous versus the superficial subcutaneous and just that specific black line, I'll never forget that myself. And it's just so helpful and eye opening. And now I will never look at love handles in the back fat specifically ever the same. And I think it's just an important conversation. And so thank you always for all the work you do and the way that you make it so easy to start healing, um, whether it's that you're struggling with obesity. So thank you again. If you can share where people can either work with you, where they can find you on social media. Yeah. So I'm on uh, Instagram with you and I'm just at, at D-R-S-E-A-N-O-M-A-R-A -A -A, and the same on Twitter as well at Dr. Sean O'Mara. And then I have a YouTube channel that uh, you can see me, Dr. Sean O'Mara on YouTube. And my website is just also my name too, www.drseanomara.com. And so I'm pretty easy to, to reach out to. I try to respond to as many comments as, as I can, but, you know, with increasing, um, you know, followers and subscribers, it becomes uh, difficult to do that. But I love my followers and I love interacting with them. So I try to interact as much as possible. And I'm, yeah, super glad to have been able to uh, be invited back uh, with you, Judy, and be able to have this discussion. You really are one of the best forces going on uh, in the area of, uh, of health improvement in, in the social media space. So um, I, I'd be excited to come back again anytime. Yes, we'll have you. I'm sure there's going to be more specific questions, but thank you so much again for your time and just for everything you do. Yeah, well, thank you, Judy. You have an awesome afternoon. You too. Okay, bye. Okay, guys, I hope you enjoyed this interview. Lots of new information, lots of good information, lots of nuance about if fasting is beneficial for you. And as I mentioned at the very beginning of the interview, also, if you should be including ferments or not. Dr. O'Mara is always open to individualized care, but he is always striving for all of us to get to optimal wellness and optimization. So if you have a little bit of back fat or love handles, you may want to start considering 
some form of movement, including sprinting, and then even considering going more low carb or even reducing all carbohydrates. I plan to ask Dr. Omera back over time. So if you have any questions, make sure to leave them in the comments, because that is where I picked up some of the questions that I asked him. Okay, guys, make sure to eat a lot of meat. Try to sprint if you can and take care of your bodies because it is the only place you have to live. I will talk to you later. Bye guys.